The UK's National Health Service turned 75, but the NHS is facing serious challenges and a great deal of criticism. So how did it get to this point? And how does this revolutionary health system compare with others in the West? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Cyril Vanier. The UK's National Health Service has been a source of pride for millions of Britons. It was created 75 years ago with the goal of providing quality health care paid for by the government through the taxes it collects. But the British public now is worried. The British Medical Association has warned that the NHS is collapsing. Access to health care is getting worse. Inequalities are also worsening and stark differences across the country are leaving large sections of the population behind. So can the NHS prosper without drastic changes? We'll put that to our guests shortly. First, though, this report. Never far from the spotlight, the UK's National Health Service, better known as the NHS, is under even more scrutiny as it turns 75. Officials warn as many as 500 people could die each week because of delays in emergency care. And the demands placed on the NHS today far surpass those during its early years. It's something that was revolutionary when it began. And in many ways, it was absolutely revolutionary to provide universal health care that was comprehensive, covered basically everything that the founders could think of and almost everything they couldn't think of. Um, and for everyone at the point of need, no bills to pay, you've already paid for it in your taxes, that was revolutionary. The NHS is a state-funded health system founded in 1948. Back then, it cost around $20 billion a year in today's money to operate. Last year, the government spent more than $350 billion. But as of last January, more than 7 million people are on a waiting list, a record number. The government is committed to reducing waiting lists, but little progress has been made. Rising energy costs and inflation mean the health service must do more with significantly less. The NHS is also coping with an aging population. A large number of people now live with chronic health conditions like heart disease and diabetes. There's also a shortage of staff and proper equipment. The King's Fund recently compared the NHS to 19 countries around the world, including uh, comparable European countries, the US and Japan. The NHS is neither a leader or a laggard, really. It comes in the middle in lots of areas, but it does do poorly per head compared to countries like France and Germany on the number of hospital beds, on the number of doctors and nurses, on the number of CT and MRI scanners. The COVID-19 pandemic severely tested the NHS and its aftermath is still posing many challenges. Health officials and experts warn for the UK's National Health Service to survive, it needs to innovate and reform. Vinton Monaghan for Inside Story. All right, let's bring in our guests who are all joining us from London today. Siva Ananda Siva, Chief Analyst at the King's Fund, an independent UK health charity organization, which uh, put out a report on the state of the NHS recently. We'll be talking about that. Dr. Sonia Adesara joins us too. You're an NHS doctor and a campaigner. And Jamie Hale is CEO of Pathfinder's Neuromuscular Alliance, run entirely for and by people with physical disabilities and your organization offers social and support services. A warm welcome to all of you to the program today. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, Siva, let's start with you. Is it a happy birthday to the NHS today, 75 years on? I think it's a really mixed birthday, to be honest with you, because as your report highlighted, the NHS finds itself at its 75th birthday at a moment of real, real strain. I mean, waiting time targets for how long you should be in an A&E department or how long you should wait for a planned hospital procedure were routinely met even as recently as 10 years ago. And now those targets have been routinely failed up and down the country. It used to be incredibly rare. It was historic for even one clinical staff group to go out on industrial action. And now nearly every significant staff group in the NHS has gone out on industrial action. So it's so it's clear that the NHS is under tremendous pressure at the moment. So a mixed birthday celebration at best, I would say. Mm. Sonia, 
Dr. Adesara, what's the conversation among health practitioners on this, uh, on this 75 year anniversary? I think NHS workers are frustrated. I think NHS workers often feel um, angry. Um, and that's because we're not able to deliver the care that we know our patients deserve. So I, I'm a GP, I work in general practice. Um, and, I, and I find it very frustrating and, and upsetting when I see that my patients are having to wait sometimes six months, sometimes a year, sometimes two years to get the care that they need. Um, and I think there was a frustration there because as you know, as Siva said, you know, we've seen the NHS and the care that we are giving decline over the past decade. And actually, as NHS workers, we have been speaking out about this. We've been speaking out about this, you know, relentlessly speaking out, saying that the standards of care are deteriorating, the conditions are deteriorating, and it's becoming more and more difficult for us to give the care that we want to deliver to our patients. Um, and you know, I think there is the, the fact that you see so many NHS workers now across the NHS from, you know, consultants to ambulance drivers, the fact that people, everyone is going on strike, that's, that's, it, we've been driven to that. And I think that, that we've been driven to that feeling of what else can we do? It doesn't seem to be mm. anyone's listening. We're seeing care deteriorate um, and, and NHS workers are going out on strike to try and, you know, force this government to listen. Jamie, your thoughts on this? I think your perspective is mixed, right, on the on the state and the benefits versus disadvantages of the NHS. So I think when you say benefits versus disadvantages, I would say it's more the benefits of the NHS and the ways in which the NHS is being failed by government underfunding and mm. therefore is not able to realise all of the potential benefits. From a patient perspective and from a perspective of running an organisation that represents a number of people with quite significant physical impairments. There's an enormous sense of gratitude and an awareness that we wouldn't be where we are without the NHS saving lives, sustaining lives, giving us the funding we need to live in the community. But it's also a series of horror stories of appointments being cancelled, waiting years for critical appointments, letters just being mislaid, people not being given the funding they need to have the care they need to live in their own homes, and a sense that we are on understaffed wards with overstretched medical professionals. And it's very clear to me as a patient that the medical professionals I see often can't give the care that they want to be giving. I've sat in a hospital room and had a nurse sit down and just burst into tears because she's so overstrained, overstretched, and working on an understaffed ward, and no medical professional wants to be in that position. Siva, your organization, uh, the King's Fund, just produced a report on the state of the NHS. What were the main findings? So if, hearing from all three of you, clearly there's underfunding, there's understaffing, and there's long waiting lists as the main symptoms of the, uh, the deterioration of the NHS. What did your report find? So you're right. What we did was look at how the UK's healthcare system, which is, of course, dominated by the NHS, compares to the health systems of 18 other countries, other, other countries with higher incomes, industrialised nations. And we found a few things. I suppose the first obvious thing is that the UK healthcare system has fewer key resources that you need to deliver good quality healthcare. We're just below average in how much we spend per person on healthcare in this country. We have fewer hospital beds, we have fewer intensive care beds, we have fewer CT and MRI scanners. And probably most importantly, we're very, very low on the number of doctors and nurses and other key professional groups compared to other countries. Now, any healthcare system in the world is going to struggle under these conditions. And so it's unsurprising that the NHS is struggling to deliver high quality healthcare outcomes. So how long patients wait for care, the quality of care they receive when they are in the system is not as good as our peers. And I would say in large part, that's because of the lack of resources that the health system is given. When you say our peers, to be clear, because our viewers will be watching this from all around the world with, and, and, and they will be experiencing in their countries very different healthcare systems, depending on where they're watching from. Your study compared the UK to a group of about 20 or so comparable countries. Is that fine? I, I read it. There were a lot of Western European countries, New Zealand, the US, Canada. Those are the countries you were comparing the UK to. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Cyril. It's, it's countries like Finland, countries like Sweden, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, countries that are either close political or economic neighbours or parts of the Anglosphere. So it does exclude large parts of the globe. But those 
those are the countries we would aspire to be towards the top of the basket of. And unfortunately, at best, we're in the middle, uh, except on resources, where, to be honest, we're towards the bottom of the league table. Dr. Adesara, can you give us, as a practitioner, can you give us, um, just tell us stories of, of what it's like to provide care in this environment? Yeah, and I think, you know, I guess the first thing I'd like to say is that when we say it is the NHS birthday and there are lots of things to celebrate about the NHS. Um, and I guess for your international viewers, the, the, the thing that I love the most about working in the NHS is that it doesn't matter whether someone has, is a, you know, is a millionaire or has no money at all. When they come in to see me in the clinic, they get they get treated equally and fairly. So we don't have, you know, insurance based systems like you have in other European countries where if you pay more, you get quicker access or better care. Mm. Everyone gets treated equally in the healthcare service, which I think is something that's quite unique and very special to the NHS, and which makes it very, you know, which is why I do love working in the health service. Um, but I guess the, but what doctor, makes it there's difficult... A, there's a caveat to that, if I can jump in, which is more and more yeah. people are choosing to pay more to yeah. get better care and go private. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah. And, that, and that's what I was just about to say is that increasingly, particularly, I think, in the past two years, I've noticed this in my clinic and I work in actually, you know, quite a poor area of London. But I've seen people, actually people who don't you know, really can't afford to, but are having to, let's say, like, you know, dip into their savings because, you know, I had I had a I had a case of an elderly gentleman who had very bad um, arthritis, so, so and also in significant pain in his hip. It was impacting his ability to walk. And the waiting time for his operation on the NHS was over a year. Um, so this poor gentleman, because he was in so much pain and becoming increasingly debilitated, chose, you know, chose to go private, use his savings, to try and get to get that surgery done quicker. And we increasingly seen that. So the latest research showed that up to, you know, Do doctor, one in six pause people for a second. choosing to go Pause for a second, because this is such a vital part of the landscape today of the NHS and getting, getting health care in the UK. Talk to us about that patient. What, what is the yeah. process of trying to get an appointment and who tells you you're going to have to wait a year and how does that get decided? Yeah, so the first difficulty is that a lot of people are finding it difficult to get a GP appointment, um, and that's because general, general practice is becoming increasingly unsustainable. We have GP practices closing across the country, so it's becoming more and more difficult for people to get a GP appointment, so there's a delay there. Then let's say you come and see me as a GP. I think that you need specialist treatment, you know, scans in the hospital. So I'll refer you to the hospital to get that done. And the waiting times now in the hospitals have been increasing significantly over the past few years. And as you said at the start of the program, we have, you know, 7 million people waiting for routine, we call it routine care. But when we say routine care, this is often, you know, in very very important care that people mm. need to relieve them of their of their disabilities or of their pain or to um to relieve to relieve them of their conditions and what we're increasingly seeing is that actually people whilst waiting to get their treatment and sometimes that can be six months that can be a year that can be you know two years sometimes I'm seeing patients their conditions get worse they're becoming li living in pain and they're becoming more debilitated as those conditions get worse um, and so you and know that's as a GP forced to go private. So yeah. as a GP, then, when you refer your patients to a specialist, you know, and you gave us the, the, the case of this um, patient who needed, uh, who had arthritis, you know that the patient mm -hmm. may not get treatment for six months or a year? Yeah, I know that with a lot of lot of conditions, the waiting times are that long. And even, you know, even with actually things that need to be treated urgently, so even with things like cancer, where we know that early treatment will improve, improve prognosis and improve people's ability to survive, even then we're seeing delays in care. People are not mm. being seen within two weeks and people are not getting their treatment within a timely manner. So we're seeing this throughout the NHS. And then also we have to talk about emergency care as well. People, you know, when you go to the emergency department, you would expect you should be seen very quickly and you should be treated quickly and that's because there's certain conditions where if you're not treated quickly then it increases your risk of dying and unfortunately we saw this particularly in the winter in the NHS that people were not getting getting treatment quickly enough and people were becoming harmed as a result you know I have a I have someone in a, a family friend of mine that actually passed away because they didn't get the care for their heart attack in time now that's a massive problem um, and we've got 
you know, <laughs> winters, you know, I know people think winter's very far away, but that's six months away. We need to be preparing now for that to make sure that people get the care that they receive in a timely manner. Um, Because otherwise people will be, you know, it's, and this is what I mean by NHS workers getting angry because we, we want our patients to get the care that they deserve. We don't want people to get harmed because they're not able to get care on time. And NHS workers do work flat out. I see that with my colleagues every day. Okay. But as you said, we need the conditions to be able to deliver that care. Jamie, on this particular issue of waiting lists, is that something either in a professional or personal capacity that you have seen deteriorate over the last decade plus? I think I can safely say that in both capacities, I've seen it deteriorate. Um, that from a personal perspective, I have been on increasingly extended waiting lists. I think it took about 18 months for one particular referral to go through to the consultant before testing could even be arranged. Mm. And this is certainly something that our members are struggling with as well. And where people have complex conditions and might be under multiple specialisms, if they are in luck, they will be under a single clinic that can coordinate all of this. But many of our members see different specialists at different hospitals with different regularities. So then to compound the long waits for appointments, the long waits for clinic letters, the long waits for tests and procedures, the clinics are not necessarily looped in with what each other's doing, which can add increasing complexity, increasing mm. delays, where we should have a system that is incredibly joined up and that ensures that patients being seen across lots of sites are receiving the collected care they need, which would save staff time and improve the experience for patients because certainly things can't keep going the way they're going. Um, for our members, one of the major concerns, particularly in winter, is chest infections. Mm. Many of us use forms of ventilation either overnight or 24 hours a day for people who have reduced respiratory function, like myself. And that means that even a simple chest infection can very quickly become life-threatening and it requires that somebody is seen and treated quickly in an A&D environment mm. and that that environment needs to have the staff time and capacity to really address the patient in the context of their full history and the clinical risks rather than just having to speed through patients as quickly as possible because then things get missed for patients with more, more complicated conditions. And I think as a community, we are all so grateful for the NHS for what it's doing, for keeping us alive, and increasingly for the community, for funding drugs that are absolute game changers for people with conditions that are progressive and that would otherwise have continued to progress. So there is that awareness that there is progress in the NHS alongside the deterioration. But at this point, we are finding that people are increasingly going private for time sensitive mm. appointments, scans and treatments. Because if your blood pressure is climbing and you're at high risk of heart failure, you don't want to wait six months to see a cardiologist necessarily. Um, Siv, I'm going to go back to you. There, there are a lot of numbers that you can crunch to try and measure the performance of a, of a given healthcare system, especially when you're trying to compare uh, between countries. I don't want to bury our viewers in numbers, but there's one that really stands out to me, and it's in your report. It's about avoidable mortality rates. Do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, and Cyril, if I was going to pick one area, I, I think I'd pick the same one that you did, which is avoidable mortality. And there are two different bits of avoidable mortality. The first is uh, preventable mortality, and the second is treatable mortality. And I'll, I'll say why both are important. Treatable mortality, because that's where, with timely and effective healthcare treatment, death could be avoided. Yeah, so you've had a heart attack, mm. but you need quick care. And unfortunately, as we heard earlier from Sonia, that doesn't always happen. But with rapid, high quality care, you can save someone's life. And the UK performs very, very poorly on this measure compared to our peers. And the other measure, which is preventable mortality, which is, you know, try and prevent the person having the heart attack in the first place or a stroke in the first place through interventions that help us lead healthier lives, maintain our health. And unfortunately, there the UK does poorly again. Mm. So without drowning people in statistics, the unfortunate reality is in this country, we are not very good at keeping people healthy or treating them when they get ill. 
Which is obviously the ultimate point and really should be the, the, uh, the primary objective of any healthcare system. I want to put those, they're so telling, I want to put those numbers up on screen. So when it comes to avoidable mortality rates, the United States stands at the, the highest, has the highest rate, which means the worst performance, with 88% of uh, avoidable mortality rate. Just behind is the UK, 69% avoidable mortality rate, and Canada's middle of the pack. I mean, you rated your organization, the King's Fund, um, looked at about 20 plus countries. We're just going to show a few here. Canada is middle of the pack, 56%. The lowest avoidable mortality rate is Australia in your ranking at 46%. So again, 46% for the best country, 69% for the UK. It's a massive gap, Siva. Yes, it is. There's huge variation in these rates of deaths per, per 100,000 people. Um, one, one thing to say, though, is that you can... It, it can feel intractable. It can feel too big. You can change your performance. You know, we saw deaths from cancer and deaths from cardiovascular disease in this country rapidly reduce when serious investment was made 20, 25 years ago. So it is a serious issue. We are not where we would want to be on the league table, but you can move up. You can improve your performance. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, like survival from breast cancer, it was a story of improvement. But unfortunately, even there, improvements are now stalling. Let's talk a little bit about how to improve this, because it's not like successive British governments haven't been made aware of these issues. Um, and poll after poll reminds British leaders that this is something British voters care about so deeply. What needs to be done? What, say, maybe top two, top three steps that need to be taken to improve uh, the state of the NHS? Dr. Adesar. Yeah, I think the first thing that's most important is staffing. You know, we, we can't deliver care. We won't have an NHS if we don't have enough staff. And that's doctors and nurses. Um, and But also even in the care sector, care workers as well, we need to have enough staff. Um, and, you know, vacancy rates in the NHS and the care sector are getting, are getting worse, not getting better. So we need to be thinking about how we train, of course, train more, train more workers, but also how we retain workers. And this is a massive problem we're seeing in the NHS right now. We have doctors and nurses leaving the NHS and they are leaving the NHS after, you know, years of training and years of devotion to the service because of conditions, um, because of deteriorating work conditions or because of burnout. So we can we can put in, the government can do things right now to try and stop that outflow, outflow of NHS workers um, in, the, in the health sector and the care sector as well. And secondly, as well, you know, I would, I would, you know, prevention is such an important thing and we talk about it a lot, but in my clinic and general practice, most, you know, majority of the conditions and we know things like heart disease um, and diabetes, these are things mm. that are preventable conditions. And we could, if we invest now to try and prevent these conditions happening, we'll be saving the NHS a lot of money in the long term. So I think investing now in prevention um, would be, would be is, is really, really important, not just for patients, but also for financially to, to bring money back into the health service. Uh, Siva, any thoughts on that? I think the numbers are pretty clear on that. It is cheaper for any government to prevent a disease rather than have to treat it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say, you know, when I look back at the end of my career, I do wonder if the single biggest thing that the UK would have done to improve the health and well-being of the population is something like the smoking ban. So yes, absolutely, we need, exactly as Sonia said, to invest in our health and care workforce, the whole health and care workforce. But another big part of what will make our health service better is reducing demand by helping people lead healthier lives. And some mm. of that will require investment, but some of it can be done through regulation, things like sugar taxes, salt taxes, uh, taking action on buy one, get one free offers. Wait, so sugar tax, salt tax, do. for people who are not familiar with that concept, is you're going to tax, say, sodas. Uh, sweets that, yeah. <laughs> that kids will flock to buy, but they're actually terrible for their health. Absolutely. So you either try and uh, put a price penalty on them to make it harder to buy them, or you encourage through that pricing the manufacturers to reformulate the drinks or the foods to make mm. them healthier. Or you, you do things like banning smoking in public places that we've already done. So these are things where, you know, we have a really heated debate in this country over the nanny state and things like that. Mm. But when you have focus groups with the public, when you look at polling, I think the public are up for this debate. You know, it is a shared responsibility for individuals to maintain their health and for the state to play its role in helping us lead healthier lives. 
Jamie, your thoughts on priority measures you would like to see a British government take to improve the NHS? So, while completely agreeing with the previous speakers on staffing being vital, I think the other two that I would want to address are joined up care and personalisation. That the more that people's care is joined up across health and social care services, including education, where that's relevant for children and young people, the more that we can reduce duplication of labour, the more that we can increase the ability to spot problems as they arise, and the better the communication, the better the patient experience, and the lower the both administrative and staffing demand. And then in terms of personalisation, one of the key costs within both the NHS and in the social care sector is adult social care and healthcare packages for disabled people living in often in the community. And where those care packages are done through private care agencies, it becomes an increasingly expensive way of delivering care in which the NHS and local authorities are beholden to the rates set by private agencies to some extent. Whereas other approaches that are far more personalised and that give people the control over their care budgets to employ the social care workers they need to live independently improve outcomes for people while saving money. So I think more investment in rolling out these increased aspects of personalisation that really empower disabled people to take control over their health and that save the NHS and the adult social care sector money are a really obvious way forward for me. Mm. Look, thank you very much to all of you. That's where we're going to end this conversation. Uh, it, it's, it's been really interesting to hear all your insights. Siva Ananda Siva, Chief Analyst at the King's Fund, Dr. Sonia Adesar, NHS doctor and campaigner, and Jamie Hale, CEO of Pathfinders Neuromuscular Alliance. I want to thank all of you for joining us on the program today. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion on this, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle, at AJ Inside Story. From me, Cyril Vanier, and from the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.